mentioned the same thing. So I'll read verse 10. It says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, and charity, charity and patience. Somebody read verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came in, came unto me at Attic and in Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and how of them all the Lord knew. Verse, verse 12, somebody else. And in all that we will let it play, in Christ Jesus, so suffer. Verse 13, somebody else. For the evil men and seducers, Shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Verse 15. And that form a it and that form a child thou hast known, the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Again, the scripture I just quoted, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17. Yeah. So he which he tells us here, Paul's reminding the believers, and Timothy especially, that everything that we're going to need in life is provided for us. But he said that, that uh, Yea, all that live in verse 12, godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So Peter's kind of bringing that same thought process here in, in, in 1 Peter. For in much as Christ has suffered in the flesh, he says, arm yourselves. Uh, and I, I wrote here, prepare. So the fact is, Jesus suffered in, in, in here on this earth. So it's no wonder that when Paul told Timothy that all that will live godly are going to suffer persecution. Uh, what Peter's telling them, he's telling the believers here, is that you have to prepare. You have to arm yourself. And obviously, we could, we could, I could ask the question, well, what would we arm ourselves with? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? That what we have to arm ourselves is with the Word of God. Uh, even Jesus did the same thing. He armed himself with the Word of God. When he was tempted and the things that came upon him, he just quoted scripture. And you know that we can learn a lot from that same example. That if we have scripture in our heart, that's what's going to keep our focus on. And not only to get us through, but to help us to be that godly example. Now, I always, I kind of always had a little bit of conflict about persecution, but sometimes persecution, uh, and if you think about it, Think of the progression of persecution, uh, how it works. You know, they, you state the, the truth, and then people persecute you because you're stating the truth. Why is that? What, why is it that they, they want to persecute you because you state the truth? Because they want to protect themselves. They think they know better. You know, either they think they know better, or... <laughs> what's that? Conviction. Yeah, conviction. It confronts them. So the truth confronts them. I mean, remember back before you were saved, when you heard the gospel. Uh, I was 20 years old when I got saved. So I, had, I remember things prior to that pretty good. If you're saved as a young person, praise God. If you were saved as a young person, you know, oh, I never had all those battles. Praise the Lord then. Be glad that you got saved. I look back and think, wouldn't it have been nice to get saved as a kid? Then I wouldn't have maybe went through as much as I had to in the things in life. Uh, and if you don't certainly need experience in the world to know how to live as a Christian. Boy, if you, as soon as you know the truth and you trust Christ, that would be awesome. So the fact that you either were saved as a young person or are, or as a young person you're saved you know, early in life, that's a, that's a real praise, but you have to prepare for the fact that you're going to be there's going to be persecution sometimes without even trying for it. <laughs> uh, so if you all that live that will live godly will suffer persecution. So it's all up there. And he says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, 
Just like Jesus, I go back to Philippians uh, when it talks about Jesus. Uh, in fact, Philippians chapter 2, let's flip back there real quick. Chapter 2, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, who was made in the likeness of men. And being found in verse 8, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto, the, unto death, even the death of the cross. Whereby God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every name, name shall, knee should bow, and the things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So, he humbled himself, and suffered persecution, that he might be exalted. So, we do it, that we might exalt Christ as well. We arm ourselves with the word of God. And then they said, and Peter says back in chapter 4, verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So that's the purpose. Even though there's persecution going to come along, things are going to happen in our life, we need to arm ourselves and prepare for the fact that we might be persecuted. And more than likely we will. Doesn't mean you have to be, but it's probably going to come whether you even try for it or not. Uh, sometimes the persecution is because of our being a knucklehead. <laughs> and that's, that's not a good one, but the fact is, is that if you live godly, it's going to rub people the wrong way. Uh, just like I know in today's society, everything is, is about trying to temper everything and not hurt somebody's feelings and this and that. Uh, it hurts my feelings. Somebody wants to live in sin and flaunt it in my face. That's offensive to me. Uh, and you know, rightly so. But we just have to, we have to arm ourselves so we don't react in the wrong way. <laughs> we want to react like Christ. He was around sinners all the time. What was his, what did they accuse him? They accused him of being a friend of sinners. <laughs> Praise the Lord that he's a friend of sinners. Because, you know, I still am one. <laughs> and probably you, you uh, maybe everybody here, here still is. Uh, still a sinner. Saved by grace, hopefully. But that's the, that's the thing. We're saved. We're still a sinner. That we don't live the rest of our time in the flesh and after those things. So Peter's really kind of getting it, getting it to him, telling him, you know what? Your life has got to live, you got to live right. Just remember what Christ did. He humbled himself and he lived right, rightly, even though he was persecuted. Uh, verse 3, chapter 4 of 1 Peter. Somebody read that. Verse 3. A couple big words there. First Peter 4 3. Yes. For the time, for the time past. Like, 
oh, I, I guess I never thought about that. I never thought about talking that way or doing this certain thing. But all of a sudden there was conviction. It was like, oh, am I doing that again? Mm -hmm. You know, so, and that's the conviction, you know. And especially as you're just saved, God doesn't come down with the big hammer, so to speak, because you just don't know yet. But as I started reading the Word of God and started going to church and hearing preaching, it was like, boy, there was some conviction. Uh, and rightly so. And I, I've heard people say where they visited, visited the church and say, oh, you know, I, 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 we would go there, but boy, every time, you know, I was convicted. And like, praise the Lord. I mean, if I go to church and I'm not convicted, there's an issue. <laughs> and it's with me. And it doesn't mean that the preacher has to be this flamboyant and perfect preacher and all these stories and laugh and, and cry and, you know, all in five minutes. It isn't about the preacher. It's about the Word of God. You know, if a person, I remember uh, probably one a person that I look back to in my life uh, was part of our church, was Dr. Norton. He was 50, over 50 years in Japan as a missionary. And as far as I know, I mean, probably one of the greatest soul winners I personally have ever known. And there was such a respect for him. And it was like, it was an honor to be able to talk to him. And I'm telling you, you went witness, with, witnessing with Dr. Norton. It was, you were witnessing for sure. It wasn't just a kind of a little soft thing. It was a bold and, and he was just a, a young guy or a small guy, but, but he was a, a ball of fire. And fact is, when he would get up and preach, you could say, wow, oh, he's not really much of a preacher. And he'd kind of read his sermon, and it was kind of just, but, uh, you know, knowing who he was, wow, that made all the difference. It's like, you talk about a man of God. I mean, he was around all the, what we would call the big shots and, and all that. And people knew him as the soul winner. Rightly so. And I'm not saying that you lift up man, but I'm telling you for a godly man that was a, a soul winner, Dr. Norton was that that to me, that's that's how I looked up to him. So when he preached the word, even if it might have been not flamboyant or or seemingly powerful, it was because it was scripture. And his his lifestyle backed it up. It was like, wow, this is you know, it, it was an honor to listen to to, to hear his preaching. So for time past, our life changed. Uh, we're strange that you run not with the same excess of writing and speaking evil of you. Those friends that I had that once I got saved and I started living for him, I had to I had to put them off. Now they weren't not they I just didn't say, hey, you're not my friend anymore. But it wasn't a friend that I hung around with as much or spent so much time with. Because all of a sudden I wanted to go this direction, and they still wanted to go that direction. So it was like, yeah, it kind of hurt because my my best friends were that way, and I had to go over here. But what I found out is the friendship I had over here was nothing compared to the friendship I had over here. Mm -hmm. Once you follow Christ, so and Peter's reminding them that you know they they're going to look at you strange. Don't feel bad. Don't go. Is it worth being a Christian? Yes. <laughs> Keep at it. Just like Christ armed himself and he had persecution and, and uh, troubles, we're going to have the same thing. And even friends might forsake you. Even godly friends may forsake you at times. It's just you follow the word of God. You have to follow and follow Christ because our relationship with Christ is what's utmost. And a lot of times there's just maybe misunderstanding. But we keep following Christ. Uh, verse 5, somebody read that. Come, folks, I give account to them that are dead in Christ. What are you going to stand before? Yeah. We're all going to give an account. <laughs> We're all going to stand before God one day. Praise the Lord. I know when I stand at the Bema seat, I won't have to give an account of my sin. Because that's already taken care of. I know when I trusted Christ as my Savior, 
It would have been the spring of 1984, sitting at home. That's when my sin was taken care of. You know, that's when I called upon Jesus and asked him to come into my heart and forgive me and save me, that the blood cleansed me from all my sin. Now I still sin, and he's still cleansing me, but my eternal destiny is settled. I started to live forever that day. Same as when you trusted Christ. Whatever the day was, you started living forever. We don't have to give an account of our sin, but we will give an account, every one of us, to God for the things that we're doing in our life now. Whether they're for Christ or they're for our selfish motives or whatever they are. Uh, verse 6, somebody read that. Lord, <clears throat> for for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, and that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So I thought I understood this verse, and then I looked at it more and did understand. Then I looked at it again and thought I did, and then I looked at it again and didn't understand it. And so I thought, well, I think I'm going to go to a commentary and see what he says. And he said about the same thing. <laughs> a couple different things that you could look at, but I, I haven't kind of got this one settled. Uh, one of the things he mentioned was, if we go back up into the chapter before, uh, in chapter 3, verse 19. Somebody read that one verse. He's referring to that possibly he's talking about, Peter's talking about here, that when Jesus was crucified, prior to his crucifixion, people were saved still saved, but kind of in a different manner. They were saved by looking forward to the cross that Christ was going to die on. By faith. Yeah, he's going to come and he's going to pay for my sin. But the fact is, is their sin wasn't covered under the blood until Calvary. So there was a place at that time, which was called Abraham's bosom. That's where those that trusted Christ in the future, were placed until Christ died on the cross. Then the blood was shed, and it paid the penalty for all mankind's sin. And it says he went, led captivity captive. He went down and basically, once that was taken place, he paid their penalty. So then they could go ascend up to heaven, because prior to that, that had taken place. That, that blood had been shed in our our lives for our for their sin. Even though God looks at doesn't look at time, He knew it was going to happen, but that's how it was. And then, they, and then Jesus led captivity captive. He said, "He might be talking about that for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Uh, those that and then He had some other thoughts, and it was like, <laughs> so I'm not going to say it's exactly what it is or not." It's just something as there's certain things in the Bible, I'm just going to say, we're not going to understand. Either we don't have enough context, uh, but I'll just trust that it's the Word of God. And, and maybe I'll know someday for sure when I'm in heaven, you know, if we have a question. Anybody have a question? What about that verse? Oh, okay. Makes sense. So there are some scriptures that we still wrestle with. It's still the truth, but there's some, some things that are a little finite. I mean, just think about uh, God being eternal. Can you really understand that? I mean, how never was. A trillion, trillion years before, what? I can't understand that. I just trust it by faith. Just like salvation, I don't understand all I can, I can, I know what I read, but just by faith, I trust it. You know, and even as somebody's saved, I remember a fellow that, that uh, got saved after I had witnessed to him, and one of his big, was Pat, I remember Pat, when he got saved. Uh, Christina. Oh, Pat Nichols. He, uh, 
I was witness to him. I knew he wasn't saved, and, and I, would, I would share the gospel with him. And he was the kind of person that he had to figure it out himself. He had to know for sure. And that's some of that. You're never going to understand it all. You're not going to understand the salvation. You just, if you realize that Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again, he paid yours and my penalty for sin, and by faith you trust him, and ask him for eternal life. You know, that, and you repent. And that was his hang-up, is he couldn't understand it yet. And that, and I kind of told him, that's why you have, that's why we have faith. Can you understand gravity, how it works? You know what is true. Uh, if I stand on top of this pulpit and I jump out and do a belly flop on the floor, gravity is going to remind me that it's real. <laughs> My back hurts just thinking about that. So things we don't understand. And I just say, here's a scripture that maybe you can't get your hand completely around it or your head around it. That's okay. You just trust it by faith. Uh, verse 7, somebody read that. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch and pray. Yeah. So Peter reminds the believers, he says, but do you realize he even at this time when it was wrote after Christ's death said what was at hand? What was it? The end. The end of all things is at hand. So the, the disciples they really thought, and Paul thought, that it's all, you know, Jesus died, he, read, he went to heaven, and that it was, he said, watch and wait. You know, it's going to, one day I'm going to return. They expected it then. It wasn't like he said, oh, you wait till thousands of years from now. So Peter's writing it to him, and he says, you have to be prepared because the, the end is at hand. It's getting close. And rightly so. He was right. Okay, so fast forward. How many years? 2,000 years later. And then I say, prepare. The end is near. So much the more. This time has passed by. And yet now today, uh, I understand the scriptures. If you're reading Daniel, and he's talking about uh, not understanding things. And God says to Daniel, shut up and think. Some of this stuff, you're not going to understand until the end. Because all of a sudden, now you're going to see things starting to line up. One world government, one world currency, one world religion. You know, right is called wrong, and wrong is called right. I mean, all that we hear about, we see. Uh, I heard a real good example. I like to listen on my way home from work. As soon as I get off the ferry, it's there on the I can get to the top of the hill coming out of Detour, and I can pick up the Christian radio station out of uh, Trout Lake. And at that time, they had like at 25 after 5, they had a little snippet of, of uh, Jimmy the Young uh, prophecy today. And it's just kind of like prophecy news and today's news. And it's just a few minutes. And it was interesting, one of, the, one of them had mentioned that when you're looking at the future, what's going on in the world, and how do you relate to prophecy? He said, when you hear things about uh, Israel, he says, because our focus is really, if you want to know what's going on in the world, look to Israel. Because that's where it's all at. Because everything happening there is kind of like, that's the main hub. Everything kind of focuses around, rightly so, because one day Jesus is going to rule and reign from where? From that location. In fact, his throne will be set up right where the temple was built and where most believe that the Garden of Eden was original. It was right there in Jerusalem. The Garden and, and the, today it's called the Temple Mount. That's where he's going to rule and reign from. No wonder Satan really wants to battle in that area. Because that's where Jesus is going to rule and reign from. And that's what he wants, Satan wants to do. So anyways, he said, when it refers in the news about Israel, 
That's like the hour hand of it, probably. When it refers to, uh, let's see, how did he put it? Israel is the hour hand. When it talks about the Jewish people, that's the minute hand. And he said, when it starts talking in the news about the temple, that's the second hand. He said, that's how close it today the talk is now. They just were talking about a member of the Knesset had mentioned and said, I think what we need to do is split up the temple now so that the Jews can worship more fully there. In order that to happen, to have that temple which will be built there, the tribulation temple, they have to have, they have to be able to, to be there. And now one of them just a said, I think we should split that area up instead of just being the Dome of the Rock, an opportunity for the Jews can kind of go there now, but they can't go there and worship like they want to. And that had to happen. He said, when you start hearing that kind of stuff, you know the second hand's ticket. It's getting close. Which is interesting. It's really interesting. I, I love to hear that kind of stuff because it, it does point right back to the Bible. So what what Peter's telling him, he says, the end of all things is at hand in verse 7. Be ye therefore sober, and I wrote to sound mind. And watch, be settled and calm unto prayer. He says, get ready. He says, it's coming. Things are happening that are it's going to happen. It's getting close. Verse 8, somebody read that. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Yeah, so charity, old English word that means what? Love. love. So he's referring, he says, have love. Above all things, have love, fervent love among yourselves. And why is it? Because that love or charity covers the multitude of sins. You know, a person can cause problems to you, maybe say bad things about you, maybe throw a stone at you and hit you. But you know, if you really truly love them, it isn't going to change anything. You're still going to love them. You know, I equate that into a, into a marriage relationship. You know, that's why today's marriages are so, they're so flimsy and they just, they're here today, gone tomorrow, because it's all on feeling. True love loves no matter what. You know, even with a disagreement, you still love that person. Uh, so he, when you have fervent love for one another, and he's talking about in the church and those among believers, there's still going to be a love for that person. So we still love them, even though maybe they caused us harm. Now, we don't love them if they're, they're trying to change the word of God, but we love them still because we make mistakes and say things wrong, too. I mean, I do. Sometimes I offend people or say something wrong or I do something wrong. But that love for them still maintains that and, and that, that focus on what's really right. And that's what Jesus did. He loved the sinner. And he, he would go and have a dinner or have things and he would talk to them. I mean, he had every right to judge him, and yet he said he wasn't here to judge. He was not willing that any should perish. He wanted to be there to, to see him get saved. That's the whole purpose. Verse 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. So kind of lit that hospitality, I wrote underneath it, I don't know if our pastor had mentioned this or what, because I'm probably not sharp enough to come up with this, but live wide open, you know, be a minister. Hospitality, it just, it's just that, that kind of an attitude that you're hospitable. <laughs> it isn't always that sharpness that you want to beat on. It's like you kind of you kind of let things roll off your back for the sake of the gospel. You know, I could go right up and tell somebody, man, you're gonna go to hell if you don't get saved, and here's a track that you can get there today. But how effective is it true? It is true. How effective, though? I mean, what's the, what's the attitude? Like, oh, man, who do you think you are? 
He says, hospitality one to another without grudging. Verse 10, it says, As every man hath received a gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And that's part of being evangelistic. You just kind of, you go on and you, you present the gospel because you realize they're sinners. Did you know that a sinner that's not saved is going to sin? <gasps> it shouldn't take you as a shock. <laughs> because that's what they do. They don't know any better. That's where they're chained to. They're in bondage to the sin. They can't get away from it. He says, use hospitality. He says, and minister one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Verse 10. Verse 11. Somebody read that. And if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as it is ability which God gives. For God is all things, and he filled all things in his soul. To whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So he says the oracles of God. That's the word of God. If any man speak. So if we're going to share the gospel, we're going to share the truth with people. Uh, I'm realizing as time goes on, it's better to quote scripture. Because it says that the word of God is not bound. And it won't return void. So I always am trying to, when I talk to somebody, at least quote, a, quote some scripture. So the word of God penetrates. Because I can tell truth and say, hey, you know, did you get saved? Jesus died on the cross and, and give them truths like that. But it's the scripture that continues to work. And that's what the Holy Spirit uses. So he, he says, if you're going to speak, speak the oracles of God. And minister, one that as God gives you the ability. Some have a better ability than others. Some can, can quote verses and, and remember things better. And some just go, I, you know, I don't know a lot. And you know what? God can use everybody. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to memorize everything in the Bible and know all the answers to the question. It's okay if they say and have a question and say, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I know where the answer is. It's in the Word of God. Maybe I'll look for it, but I don't know that. Sometimes that will speak more volumes than you trying to help always have the answer. So he says it's speak the word of God and minister as the ability, whatever God's given you for the ability, that ultimately that God would be glorified. That's the whole purpose of our life. That's the reason he's left us here is to be able to glorify him. And we, we won't get through this whole chapter because Peter wrote too much. <laughs> There's too much here. Uh, but he says... And we'll kind of end it at there because he did end it there. He said, "Amen." You know, that's a, that's the typical uh, preacher ending the message halfway through it <laughs> and still going. And we won't have time to do that. But he said, "We'll leave it at that. Take the word of God. Be that minister with whatever God's given you. Love, as he's mentioned. He says, and just like Christ suffered, we're probably going to suffer too. But that's okay." Just go on and do a work for God with what God's given you. Don't leave the past behind and work on towards towards the, the goal or the, or the uh, cross. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just some words that we can look at you in the Word of God. The very Word of God that Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down. I pray that each one of us would just take even bits and pieces, or take the whole passage and take it to heart and live it out. Lord, this world, oh, this world needs us, not, doesn't need us personally, but it needs you. So help us to reflect you in our lives 